Welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. And this is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. Is that really how we start the intro? <laughs> I don't know anymore. I don't know either. I screwed it up the first time, so now I'm really confused. It's always but, the thing that we screw up the most. It's yeah, the intro. It's the thing that we say repeatedly over and over again. Exactly right. the same. <laughs> and when we first started, it was always the um, tagline that we'd screw up. Like true. The first part of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. True. We've come so far now. We have. We have. <laughs> How's it going? Um, it's birthday. Today is my birthday, the day we're recording, not the day this drops. Right. It's already passed, but today we're recording on my birthday. So I'm hanging out with my girl. Yeah. Some true crime Yay. on my birthday. And I am now 40. And how do I sound? And fabulous. <laughs> You sound fabulous. I do. <laughs> so Christy texts me earlier because I've I'm just I'm having a hard time with this birthday. And she texts me earlier and is like, Happy birthday, love you, whatever. And then she says, Are you okay? <laughs> I was like, Well, I haven't broken a hip or anything yet, so I guess I'm pretty good. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> well, I, d- I needed to check on you. I wanted to be excited about your birthday, but then I was like, but I really got to check on her. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true friend. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. And I'm like, looking forward to seeing you. I know. Oh my gosh. We're going to celebrate together pretty That's soon. We'll soon. have to tell you guys all about it. So we're excited. Yes. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, And that's like another trip I'm going on because I just came back from a trip last weekend. I went to Napa to go wine drinking. Looked so fun. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Went with a really good group of girls. Um, We had an amazingly weird house. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I sent Beth pictures. I even posted them on my personal um, social media. But this house was like, I mean, architecturally, it's very old and it was cool once you saw it in the light but we got there and it was dark and we could barely find the front door first of all let me tell you there's a tenant over the garage and we never saw her which they said we would never see her she's real quiet like just goes and and she doesn't have access to the grounds when someone's renting the house well we got there and parked in front of the garage and proceeded to go up the stairs of the garage and couldn't find the lockbox to the door and so we're just like all four of us on this tiny little landing with all of our suitcases. Well, maybe only a few suitcases. And we're like making all this noise. And then my friend Kelly looks in the sliding glass door that's off to the right. She's like, I'm pretty sure someone's living here right now. <laughs> and oh. I was like, well, they do live here. I think they just like go when people rent it. And she's like, no, no, no. Like currently there's a water bottle and some workout equipment on the floor. <laughs> Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, this is Amy's apartment. <laughs> so we like run down the stairs. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> it was so dark that we couldn't see the house that was actually like to the right of the drive. Like, yeah, it was so dark out. So we pull out flashlights, we go in, we finally get in the house and we're just like, this is really creepy. This house, there's lots of sliding glass doors, windows, and it's all dark outside. And we can't find any lights. And we're like, oh my gosh, people are going to come in here and murder us. <laughs> and as we <laughs> We're walking around. We just noticed all these little weird things like, um, oh, there was a picture on the wall that looked like two serial killers. It was yeah, two it young guys with really weird haircuts with horses. Mm-hmm. And they were like, had these like stoic faces on, like looking at, it was like they were looking into my soul from the picture. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> Scary. Um, and then there was a random like tissue paper flower all the way high on a wall in the kitchen. Not covering a hole. We thought it was covering a hole. I literally got on a chair and was like, is there a hole there? <laughs> no, mm-mm, just on there. It was like somebody had a baby shower and they stuck it up there and never took it down. <laughs> they didn't. That was too high up. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. Why else is it up there? <laughs> and then there was also a five of diamonds in a air vent. They like air conditioning or heat vent that you could just see. Like I just walked by and I was like, what's that there for? <laughs> there. And what was the last thing? Oh, the closet that had like all like uh, the water heater in it and like a vacuum and like any cleaning supplies. It had water heater, like signs, you know, like those little signs that you would like type out like on a label maker. Yes. Label maker sign. It said water heater, 
um, cleaning supplies, Smurfs. <laughs> <laughs> and there were none. <laughs> there were no Smurfs. Totally misleading. I'm not going to lie. We looked more than one time because we were convinced there had to be some <laughs> sort of Smurf in there. <laughs> you should put one of those like fake ones in there. So Christy was sending me pictures and was like, find the weird thing. <laughs> in the picture, I'm like, what kind of a puzzle house are you staying in right now? Like, my gosh, <laughs> it was up, Napa. Extremely interesting. And the next morning, we were all like, "Oh, this is actually kind of a, it's a cool property. It's a cool house. It's quirky, but it's cool." Like, we were fine, but it was the first night we were like, "Oh my gosh, what's going on?" <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, yeah it was weird. <laughs> fun trip though. 100% fun. So Well, good. And I'm glad you didn't get murdered or your soul stolen by the horse boys. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I took it for the, one for the team and I slept in the bedroom right next to that picture because everybody oh. else was upstairs. I'm like, I'll do it. I do it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Brave soul. It did make me buy sage on the trip though. So, <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> there you go then. So, anyway. So, um, here, the, today's a collab episode. It is so yes. long. You guys are in for a treat. Yeah, get to hang is. out with Bryce from What Happens in the Woods, and he's gonna. T- nope, no Jet. Nope, it's true. From What Happens in the Woods, and she's Bryce come- and you were last Friday. Yes, go back and listen to What Happens in the Woods episode with Bryce and Beth. Yes, I tell a spook a Halloween crime, mm-hmm. and then it's crazy. So go back and listen to that if you have not already. Why haven't you? Yeah. Go yep, do that. and do it. Yeah. But so here's here's our collab with Jess and Christy. Yeah. Enjoy it. Okay. Okay. So here we are with our friend Jess from What Happens in the Woods. Hey guys. Bryce. Hello. So excited you guys are here. We're super excited. You guys got to go check them out. They are our pod besties and Jess is the research queen. That's what we call her over here in the closet. (laughs) She does mega research and always impresses us and we cannot wait to hear what she has to tell us today. She's going to bring you all a story. Yeah, man. I got a story. I got a spooky (laughs) Murder. Ooh, spooky. Yeah. Ooh, all right. So get yeah. your drink and let's hear what Jess has to say. Take it away, girl. All right. So in my research uh, earlier this year, this actually, this case that I stumbled upon came about researching. Um, if anybody has listened, at the beginning of our season uh, three, we did some old older cases local to Washington area. So this case is a murder that I came across that took place the night before Halloween. So not on Halloween. That was 1947. So we're going way back. Wow. Yeah. Old one. Yeah. Um, I I mean, I say it all the time on our podcast, but I love old timey crime. I love it. Mm -hmm. I can't get enough of it because you assume that these people are so straight laced and what possibly could have taken place in 1947. A lot did. Well, I'm just hearing how they <laughs> how they like tie it all together too, because it's completely different. That you know, yeah. investigations and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. The processes. So, what stood out to me is that the story has a spooky element to it, kind of like a supernatural mm. ending, if you will. What also stood out was how many times it's mentioned that the man responsible for the murders is one of the like most unrecognized serial killers. Oh, no. Right. Yeah, I, I had to do it with a serial killer. Sorry. <laughs> well, I we were done. <laughs> I'm not going to go into all of his murders. I'm, I'm just going to focus on what happened here in Tacoma. Okay. So we'll start with a murder that ended in the capture of the gentleman in question. They, uh, the media, the press named him the Tacoma Axe Killer. Hmm. Yeah, it was around 2 a.m. on October 30th, 1947, when Bertha Klut was awakened by a man in her room holding an axe while going through her purse. As you can imagine, Bertha was startled and she 
um, apparently engaged to try to get this guy out of the house. So Bertha, who was 53, and her daughter Beverly, who was 17, were alone in their home on South 21st Street in Tacoma. Bertha was the first to fall victim to the burglar, and when the daughter heard screaming, she came downstairs to find a man in the kitchen with an axe and was attacked as well. Yikes. Yeah, neither woman survived their attacks. Oh. So neighbors heard the screams. There were a few, you know, calls into the local police station um, to come out and take a look, see what, what all the noise was going on about. So two police officers, Officer uh, Sabatis and Officer Davies, arrived at the home. They are kind of looking around. They notice that there's a gentleman running out of the back door trying to get away from the house real quick. Oh. Yeah. Wow. So the officers chase the guy. He's climbing fences. He's running through things, alleyways. He's he's not trying to get caught. And eventually he gets caught up by a tall fence that he couldn't climb over and he was cornered. He wasn't going down though without a fight. So he pulls out a small blade that he had and he uses it to slash up the officers pretty good. He does cause some serious injuries, but nothing life-threatening to these officers. Oh my word. My gosh. Yeah, he was not going down. Okay. Scrappy. So, yeah, he's scrappy, yeah. In the end, um, he he's had so apparently one of the officers that uh his, I, I can't remember which one. I believe it was Dr. or Dr. Officer Sabatis. Um, he was a retired prize fighter and he clean clocked him with a, a left hook during this, yes. you know, scruff, scruffluffle. I love that word, scruffluffle. <laughs> so the man taken into custody was 45 year old Jake Bird. You guys heard of Jake Bird? Mm -mm. Okay. Negative. Okay. So Jake was an African-American man who'd come to Tacoma, um, just this area for work. Basically, he was an actual hobo, what they actually considered a hobo, you know, back in the day. Mm -hmm. He would land in an area, he would work a bit, and then he, you know, when the work dried up, he'd hop back on the train and he would head out of town for the next place where he could find work. I wonder if a hobo is different than a vagrant. They because are. Because a lot, okay, so a, yeah. a hobo works. Not necessarily. I hobo, think a vagrant doesn't. So hobos typically, if I remember correctly, the definition, and this is um, coming from them, this lifestyle, is literally just hopping on trains and going to where they go. Hmm. They get off where they want to get off. They get hop back on a train, and that's just their lifestyle. Sometimes they will find work. Sometimes they won't necessarily, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but a vagrant is just somebody that wanders aimlessly, not like no aspiration, and, and definitely has no, yeah, mm -hmm. not necessarily traveling from area to area, um, like train traveling. Hobos are, I think, specific to train traveling. And it, okay. I, there was a documentary we watched or we listened to something. What yeah. was that? Uh, no, it was just. Yeah, documenting the hobos and their yeah. lifestyle, and I I yeah. didn't know, it. but they only hop on freight trains. They don't they don't hop on the Amtrak's. No, no, no not the, the passenger the trains. Yeah. They are just freight right. trains. But they also like the landing spots. They had like, and I don't remember what they meant, but like specific symbols, like they would right. draw on like walls, and you know, other hobos knew the language. And right. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a very wow. interesting. Okay. It's not the same, and they they had like gangs. So that they, I, for lack of a better term, like um, groups of people that they would be safe with if they travel mm -hmm. together. Like it, it really is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and, Interesting. and they, I mean, even to this day, they, they don't like it when the term hobo is used out of context. Right. Okay. And, yeah. Okay. So, so he, he was an actual hobo though. Mm-hmm. So at this time, um, you know, where he landed in Tacoma, he actually landed there because he was working for the railroad laying track as something called a Gandhi dancer. And I had to look up the meaning of that because I was like, well, that sounds mm -hmm. pretty cool. What the hell is that? <laughs> no, I was expecting like some weird or mysterious job. It's literally just slang at the time for laying down railroad tracks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it really I it made it sound way more glorified than I I was uh -uh. very disappointed by that. Yeah. <laughs> so in 
So Jake had left home at age 19. He just pretty much left everything behind. He struck out to see what he could find. And I did read, there's not much on his prior life that's available. Um, mainly, I think, because he was an African-American man. Mm-hmm. And mainly, um, and you know, side to that, I think, because of the time. You know, 1947 record keeping was right. um, not as good, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he, you know, what I read was that home life was hard, but like I said, there's not really a mention of of what was hard. Was it because his family was, you know, poor or was it abusive? I, I'm not sure what it was. Mm-hmm. He decided at age 19, he was just going to go and, and seek his fortune. Jake also had a history of crime prior to this. Authorities learned in 1928 he had been sentenced to serve 30 years in an Iowa State Penitentiary for the attempted murder of a husband and wife. His weapon of choice, again, was an axe. 30 years? Oh. You stick with what you know. Yes. Yeah, so I was like, how could he serve 30 years? <laughs> right. Good behavior got him released in 1941. He ended up serving maybe about 15. Huh. Oh. Um, yeah. He ended up in Tacoma as um, it literally is the end of the line. So Tacoma at that time was known as uh, like the great destiny, basically. You could get to the end of the line as the coin was, uh, the term was coined. Um, mm. it, it was the end of the line. And he was just roaming and picking up work where he could. So after the fight with the two officers, where he's slashing and hashing, The three of them took a trip to the hospital to get looked at. One officer had been stabbed in the shoulder. The other had a hand injury from being slashed. There's also an account that I will later mention a little bit more um, that while in custody, he was not treated the best by authorities. As Mm -hmm. you would imagine, an African-American man in 1947 Mm -hmm. who came out supposedly from a house where white women were murdered. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be treated fairly. Right. Right. He was also evaluated at that time, and he was deemed, quote, not too badly injured. He had been beaten with a nightstick, but, you know, he wasn't badly injured. He's Mm -hmm. not to mention the prize fighter who clean clocked him. Right. So while they're getting medical attention, other police officers were inside the house where the women were confirmed to have been violently killed. It was uh, incredibly and horrifically bloody. Um, There was skin tissue, brain matter, blood mm. throughout the downstairs. Oh, and all with an axe. All with an axe. Oh, Jake was then, yeah, taken to the station, interrogated by a detective. And as they're talking to Jake, he's telling them he didn't do anything. He claims he's innocent. He claims the detective stated, um, you know, that... It, they don't they can't tie him to this the detectives are are saying one thing and he's like yeah no that wasn't me i didn't do that it was another negro his term um it was another negro and they're like well who what negro and he says oh leroy some other guy and they're hmm. like there's no leroy i don't know we don't know who you're talking about what you always were found there um and again that is his terminology i would never say that no, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Just so everybody knows. I know. I know. Um, yeah. He says he's innocent. It's not him. And they they said that he was so convincing um, that they might have believed him. They might have believed him. He might have got away with it, except he was covered in blood and other things evident of the type of crime <laughs> oh my he committed. What? Come on. They were on the porch at the bottom. Right. <laughs> except for all the evidence. I'm, I'm a they zombie. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I regularly have, you know, brain matter on my clothing. Ay, so they persisted and eventually the police have a signed confession from Jake. He tells oh. them he was just looking to rob the house and that it was randomly picked. It was not um, premeditated in any way. He just came across the house. He found an axe in the shed out back and he stated he was going to use it to, quote, bluff off someone who would bother him. Then he took his shoes off in an attempt to be quiet while going through the house. He went into the downstairs bedroom, which was Bertha's, and was able to get into her purse and steal a dollar fifty. <laughs> Any guesses on the value of what that is today? No, that's what I was going to ask. Wait, actually. so it's nineteen forty-seven. Nineteen forty-seven, a dollar fifty. I would say like ten dollars. Mm, 
Any other guesses? Um, I don't know by your Christy. Mm, more mm. than, but I'm going to say eight yeah, fifty. A little, a little higher, <laughs> oh, higher than 10. you were going higher. Okay, yeah, twelve dollars. Bryce, you got a guess? Thirty dollars. Final answer. Okay, so you guys, you, it, it's in between both all of oh. you. Um, so eighteen dollars and seventeen cents. Okay. Oh, wow. huh. Yeah, all of this $18? for eighteen dollars and seventeen cents. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Unfortunately, Bertha woke up, and that's where he was. You know, he was there, and she confronted him from his account, and started to, you know, try to get him out of the house. Basically, confronted and started ushering him out. And he says he just kind of panicked and attacked her with the axe. Because that's what I do, right? Mm -hmm. You scared um, me, right? <laughs> oh god. He, I mean, he if you're going to pull an axe and bring it into a house, you yeah. have to, I mean, come That's on. That's the thing is you, you intend for violence before you went yeah. into that house. You intend violence. Right. Right. If, if you were just looking for some money, you would have quietly gone in, tried to get some money and quietly left. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm not sure why you needed the, the axe. Especially Again, a woman. She doesn't know. pose that big of a threat to him. Like just drop the purse and run out or take the purse and run out. I mean, he out. probably put could his have shoes slapped her. That's the thing. He, he didn't put his shoes back on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. So then he would have left behind evidence. <laughs> I mean, he he could have probably just run out of the house at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he. I'm sure he could have probably outrun her if he was yeah. hopping fences yeah. and evading mm -hmm. the police so well. I'm sure yes. he could have run out of the police, the house and mm -hmm. and been fine. After hearing screaming and loud noises from downstairs, he states that the daughter Beverly came down, found Jake in the kitchen. Of course, he looks a mess. And she, you know, starts to also put up a fight. Again, instead of running out of the house, he killed her with the axe as well. When he heard the police show up to check on the di disturbance, he attempted to flee out the back. And that's so, where we ended up. He didn't leave because it mm -hmm. had to have taken time for the police to get there. Yeah. It's I'm 1947. Right. right. Yeah. That is it's, one of my points. Yeah. Just stuck around. Right. Um, after, you know, all of that goes down, I, one of my points was I'm not sure how long that all took place mm. and I'm not sure how much time he had in the house. I'm also not sure where the police were. They may have been, I mean, Tacoma at that time, I think still had a reputation for not being the safest mm -hmm. simply because it was a large port and it um, was an area that had a lot of industry. So I do think that there are probably going to be some police officers that were, you know, would sit in their car and wait for a call, kind of how they used to do. But there again, don't know how long it took them to show up. They mm -hmm. could have, right. you know, it, they could have been miles away and he had all this time in the house doing what, who knows. Mm-hmm. Now that they have his confession, Jake was charged on Halloween. Here's where Halloween comes into play. So he was charged with first degree murder and they're stating he intended to do this and he had, you know, premeditated this mur these murders. Um, interesting side note, they only charged him with Bertha's, so the mom's murder. Apparently at that time, it was common practice that they would not charge for multiple murders in case the first murder charge did not go through, they had a plan B. Oh, yep. yeah. So okay. they only charged him with Bertha's murder. Um, and it, like I said, first degree murder. Authorities are quick to get a trial scheduled less than a month away. So in November, he's on trial. Hmm. During this time, he's held without bail. Jake is worried that he won't get a fair trial and his defense lawyer requests to have the trial moved out of Pierce County. It's denied. The lawyer also puts in the request for Jake to defend himself. Jake wanted to defend himself. And that's also denied by the judge. Um, from what I can see, the best that they did do, which is somewhat of a concession, is to make sure that a somewhat fair jury selection happened. So, of course, there were no members of the jury who were people of color. Of course not. Mm -hmm. It was made up of nine white men and three white women. Totally fair. Right. Um, the Definitely the, his peers. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. They did dismiss some potential jurors because they were looking at um, apparently the jury 
selection, the pool to pull from was so small that some of these other people had just come off of another murder trial. Oh my word. I don't word. understand because like, Kona's what? not a small town and it, it, it wasn't a small town then. So I don't, I don't know how that happened, but yeah. So they did dismiss four people for potential jurors because of that fact. Hmm. And yeah, it kind of caught me off guard. I was like, what, yeah. what murders are happening all over the place that you can't even pull fresh juries? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gosh. Well, I guess they just figured they're already there. Just move them into the other room. <laughs> I mean, it saves time, efficient. They had to get this going. Yeah. Yeah. They wasted no time. The trial began November 24th, 1947. So less than a month after these murders, it ended on the 26th. So just three days. Half of that was jury selection. Hmm, right. So they really only had a day and a half on this okay. trial. Jake's defense team reluctantly worked on his behalf, really didn't want to do it. Um, one of the arresting officers took the stand during the trial. And this is where that um, side note comes into play. He all but admitted to beating the crap out of Jake after they saw the condition of the women in the home. To quote mm -hmm. Officer John Hickey, I regret to say that I lost my temper after returning from the clut home and viewing the terribly hacked bodies of the two women. Hmm. The officer admits to beating Jake with his nightstick several times while he's cuffed and in custody in the back of the police wagon. He was in the back of the town. car? Yeah. When they were beating him? He's in the him? police wagon. He was like, turn around and whack him? That's what he said. He literally says he took his nightstick and turned around and whacked him. That is Okay. No, it's absolutely not okay. And the fact that this officer took a stand, was mm -hmm. under oath, admitted to this, he was not reprimanded in any way. No, oh, of course not. He didn't, it, it didn't change the outcome for Jake. Nobody was sympathetic to that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And everybody still thought that this was going to be fair. It's, mm -hmm. this is the stuff that, it, these are the things that I, I read and it, makes my stomach just drop mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you know he wasn't treated fairly. You absolutely know he wasn't treated fairly. Not you in can't treat any human like that. Like if a person no. is trying no. to come at you and you have to fight back, that's one thing. But if they're handcuffed in the back of your right. car. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure when they did take him to the hospital to get medical, quote unquote, medical attention, I'm sure it was like, yeah, you're, you're fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. Walk it <sighs> off. Walk it off. Yeah, right. Yeah. So after only a half an hour of deliberation, the jury came back to give a guilty verdict of first degree murder and recommended the death penalty. Judge mm -hmm. E. D. Hodge would later sentence Jake Bird to be put to death by hanging. Oh my gosh. All right. So here's where here's where it gets interesting. <laughs> Here's where it gets interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah, girl, hold on to those pants. So at the sentencing, Jake is allowed to make a statement um, after, you know, the closing arguments or closing statements by each side. At the sentencing, they still get to, you know, the defense and the prosecutors get to have a moment. He gets a moment. He stands up and he speaks for 20 minutes about the injustice of the trial, how he should have been allowed to defend himself, and that basically his defense was not working for him. They did during the trial make concessions and, and try to, you know, argue some of the evidence that was found. Um, by the way, his shoes were found in the home. He left out the back shoeless and his fingerprints were supposedly that were found on the bloody axe handle were a match for him. Okay. I'm not sure that I believe their evidence, given that they wanted to try him and, and convict him. I'm not saying he's innocent either. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm, I just don't know how I feel about them connecting his fingerprints to that axe handle. I, I can't 100% say that I feel that they did the right thing with that. Um, but also he did have the blood and brain, brain uh, matter on his clothing when he was taken into custody. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, back to the sentencing, he stands up, he's, you know, giving his statements and at the end of that 20 minutes in which he addresses the court, he states, quote, all of you who had anything to do with my case will be punished. I am putting the Jake Bird hex on you. Mark my words, you will die before I do. End quote. Jake Bird hex? Jake Bird hex. And hmm. when I read that, I don't know why, but I got full body chills. I was like, Same. okay, that's, that's some stuff. All right. 
<laughs> so then he's taken very next day to Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla um, to await execution. And they don't mess around with this either. He was scheduled for January 16th of 1948. So his sentencing was December 6th. His trial was December or November 24th, ended on the 26th. His sentencing was December 6th. By January of 20, um, January 16th of 1948, he's scheduled to be executed. Whoa. I mean, this is less than six months, and they've gone through the whole shebang, right? Mm -hmm. With mm -hmm. justice. Right. However, the next day he begins to tell authorities that he's been involved in upwards of 44 other murders that he could help, quote, clear up as a way to clear his conscience. Right. Making well, a course, deal to save his life. Exactly. Well, to keep him alive longer, too. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So while these are being investigated, because, of course, now they're like, well, what do we do? We we don't want him to stay alive, but we we want to be able to investigate these other things. So after the county prosecutor and the police detective um, that had initially interviewed him goes out, they're talking to him. They get over 174 pages of confession from him. Handwritten. I mean, this is 174, 174 pages Jeez. of these uh, supposed other 44 or plus murders that he committed. So, oh my gosh, wide they take down their college. Constant. What's that? <laughs> wide oh, wide wide college. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> it's legal pads, girl. It's legal yeah. pads. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So they take all these statements on, you know, all of this other information that he's giving and a 60 day stay of execution was granted the day before he was supposed to be hanged by the governor. Wow. They had all these people from other states, all these other, you know, agencies contacting and saying, please, we want to solve this cold case. Mm -hmm. If he did this, then we need to investigate it. So by this, it just, by the, you know, what is that? Skin of his hair. Skin of his teeth. Yeah, skin, skin of his teeth. I don't know why. Skin of what teeth? I know, right? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> That's gross. Um, he he gets that just the day before he's supposed to be hanged. He gets a 60-day stay of execution. Out of the 44 murders or about 44 murders that Jake admits to committing, police from Illinois, Kentucky, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Iowa were able to verify information and close 11 cold cases. Wow. Shut up. They, they panned out? Right. So he was considered the prime suspect in others out of the 44 that they couldn't necessarily. He had very detailed inside information that he gave them. Mm. They couldn't tell for sure whether he was the suspect or if he was just a prime suspect. So they only cl closed 11 out of the numerous that he gave them, which is still, a, that's, you know, a fourth. That's a quarter of what he gave them. Right. Yeah. I just feel like if you're giving that much in th at that time, then you must have had something to do with it. That, like if he's giving such detailed information about all those other ones. Yeah, because they, it's not like he could just sit down and Google murders and be like, well, right, I'm going to tell him this. In all of those different states. Like, right. Right. So- but here's the thing. While he was incarcerated um, in Iowa on the attempted murder, he was one of the murders that he um, later confessed to. He was in or in the jail cell with or um, became friends with a man who was currently serving time for a murder that Jake then admitted to doing later on. Oh, so, so you he, just think he wants may or may not have actually committed these murders in my mind. Mm -hmm. That's me piecing that together. Um, the articles that I've read alluded to that. Nobody came out and said it. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I don't know how credible you can be when they already had a man who had been serving 19 years in jail on a murder and been convicted. Mm hmm. You have intimate knowledge then if you strike up a conversation, you're like, hey, what are you in for? And he starts saying, oh, yeah, you know, I, I killed these these people or I killed this person. Mm, mm, okay. You're going to have intimate details of that. So yeah, how many of those conversations did he have? Right. While he was in jail. 
Right. He was considered a very like charismatic person, very intelligent, very charismatic, um, you know, not necessarily got along with everybody, but when he chose to speak, he he was intriguing to people. So he may very well have had multiple conversations with many inmates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During that time. That's a heck of a scam. Right. So the thing is, he willingly gives this information. I don't know why you would give that information other than to prolong your life. Mm -hmm. Because while all this is happening, he is filing appeals. He, you know, uh, he got a new lawyer because his other lawyer was like, well, they, they convicted you and there's nothing more I can do. I refuse to appeal for you. So he got a new lawyer who was helping him with appeals. The first appeal that he did, he actually um, represented himself and went to the Washington State Supreme Court. And his retrial um, request was denied. So then his new lawyer started working on other appeals right up to his execution, uh, new execution date. And that was July 15th, 1949. None of these appeals resulted in anything helpful. Hmm. So So he's filing appeals. Right. On his conviction of murder. Right. But at the same time, confessing to other murders. Right. So there again, I don't know. Are you trying to prolong your life? Because you know, those appeals are going to take longer than basically what? 40 days. Mm -hmm. He had from sentencing in December of 1947, December 6th to January 16th was his execution date. Mm -hmm. That's 40 some days, right? 40 days. Um, And then he was able to get a 60 day stay of execution. Right. So during all of that time, he's basically prolonging things so that he could try to appeal is what I'm thinking. But even if he gets, even if an appeal is granted, based on some technicality that he finally gets somebody to like agree to like, Oh, my representation sucked because they didn't even want to be there. He still admitted to all these other ones. So he's just going to have right. another trial and he would yeah, have another so it's trial just prolonging cause him more problems right. for himself. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, I, I kind of, that's why I'm kind of on the fence and maybe that's why nobody's pieced that together or come out and said that maybe, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that this is what he was doing. I'm kind of on the fence about it. Yeah. I just, I don't know why you would admit to these murders if you weren't trying to buy time. But then again, maybe he did them. Maybe he did. I mean, right. it, you, you got to have um, some cojones to come into somebody's house with an ax and yeah. butcher them mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. It's you hard know? to believe that that that's would be your like first your murder. out the gate. Yeah. Right. Like that's your mm-hmm. out the gate crime. Yeah. So, so the appeals went nowhere. Um, Jake Bird was hung in front, hanged in front of a crowd of 125 people on the morning of July 15th. Um, yeah, July 15th, 1949. Wow. Yeah. Wow. His remains are buried, buried on the state pin grounds in Walla Walla with only his inmate number of 21520 on the marker. He didn't even get a name. What? Yeah. You it's, give it's them some, names? I mean, I know you're a murderer, but you got a person also. Yeah, you're still a person. Yeah. As for the hex, don't forget about the hex. I was going to ask about that. Did any of the what happened? (laughs) Right. So that hex was made good on Jake's word. There were five men who died seemingly of quite unexpected health issues within a year after his sentencing. All five of these men were due to a heart attack. The first was Judge Hodge, who sentenced him. He died less than a month after the sentencing. No way. Right. Then there was the undersheriff, Joseph Karpak, and Detective Lieutenant Sherman Lyons, who had arrested him and taken his statements. Court reporter George Harrigan. And lastly, the defense attorney who didn't want to defend him, James Selden, rounded out those five men. Huh. One man, a guard named Arthur Stewart, who was assigned to, uh, you know, be his guard in death row, died before Jake's actual execution of pneumonia, though, not a heart attack. But Mm. those five men within that year, before he died, all heart attacks. That is bananas. Right. It's a little too much of a coincidence for me. 
I mean, given right. that there's varying ages here, there's varying levels of health, heart attacks, I could see if it was different things in but each right. case. people in such a small circle is right. of all the same thing. Right. Just it's, cra- it's, it's crazy. That's some <clears throat> spooky stuff, man. Mm-hmm, that is. Yeah. So, like I said, there were a lot of mentions in every article that I read about how prolific a killer Jake Bird was and also mentions of the oddity of a black person being a serial killer when oh. statistically it is white males. Yeah. Mm. Um, even in 1947. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I'm, yeah, even mm-hmm. now. I'm not sure what to make of all that because of the confessions and, you know, how they obtain them. I'm just... You know, it concerns me because here's an African-American man in the 1940s who's convicted of killing two white women. Do we really think that he willingly told authorities anything? I really right. doubt it. Right. Now, the 11, the 11 that the other policemen or police forces, whatever, were able mm-hmm. to link him to was just based on his confession or based on evidence? Based off of his confession and based, they were cold cases. Right. So because he was a, a person who traveled, mm. they had evidence that they couldn't link to anybody because that person then was gone. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So he had intimate information. He had in detail information and they had evidence to support it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Why didn't they ever charge him with it? Um, by that well, by that time he's scheduled for execution so it was oh. they considered it a closed matter and it's done huh i'm sure that they were waiting if he had mm. been able to win an appeal i'm right. sure that they there was plenty of of um authorities in the in the wings waiting for him to get an appeal and and then charge him yeah. right well they yeah. all died yeah. he also could have been charged yeah. for the daughter's death too because right they, that was right. not included so i mean there was that one that he already confessed to Mm-hmm. Right. So if if for some reason he did get an appeal and he got a retrial and he was found not guilty, they would have just turned around and charged him with the death of right. the daughter. Go ahead and represent yourself and do all the right. stuff that you didn't like about the first trial and exactly. we'll still get you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, another like a obviously incorrect fact that's listed a few times I want to mention in the articles is that he served 31 years of his life in prison. I don't know how that is mathematically accurate. It's not possible. The man was only 45 at the time of these murders in 1947. He went to jail when he was six. Right. (laughs) Given how many murders he supposedly confessed to, he would have had to have killed multiple people on a daily basis over like a month period of time. It's just not possible. So a lot of these facts, um, people need to do better. I'm sorry. That's just, it's lazy. It's lazy, you know, reporting. Yeah. It's not possible. It's not mathematically possible. And even I can do that math. So if I can do it well, and I find it not accurate, you ain't accurate. Were they they must have been confusing. Wasn't he like sentenced to 31 that first time? Is that what you right. said? He was sentenced. So maybe they were just he didn't confusing serve. that. Yeah. I think yeah, I think uh there's just a oh, 30 years. Oh, okay, let me put that in there. Kind of right, thing. right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah um and that I will just say a side note. That's just like my pet peeve. Like I make mistakes. I have made mistakes before as well. I have, I do. Um, But I go back and correct them. These are written Mm -hmm. articles online that somebody could go back and and Mm -hmm. edit and correct. Right. Last update. Right. October 11th, 2021. (laughs) Exactly. Due diligence, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So there we have it. Spooky, spooky. Well, he yes. doesn't sound very nice. No, it yeah, he probably was. No, like, but I do think he was probably treated unfairly. Yeah, no, I'm sure he was not treated fairly whatsoever. I'm, and like I said, I I'm not sure that he's not guilty. He probably is. Right. If the evidence that they had is correct, the shoes were left, his hand hand or fingerprint on the axe handle, right. the brain, and matter. the the brain matter and things on his clothing. Yeah. Yeah. But you I, still don't get to treat him that way. You don't get to beat somebody when they can't defend themselves. That's no. The lowest you know, of the low. Memories of recent events. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Right. Like, we won't go there. Yeah. No. And, you can be and criminal, but you're still a human. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you know mm-hmm. darn well you, you were able to take him into custody. That's right. where it ends. That's it. Mm-hmm. You have you got him. custody. He's not fighting you. I don't care what he's done to you at that point. You've done your job. 
Right. Walk You're away. not judge and jury here. Right. Bye. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and as sad as the this is sad. It's sad even more, like you said, recent events. This mm-hmm. is still happening. And that's right. we don't learn. We don't learn our lesson. Some people do, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. yeah. Very unfortunate. But yeah, I I couldn't with that spooky element, and then they're like yeah. oh, prolific serial killer yeah, that, that nobody talks about. And I'm like, how is this a serial killer that I've never heard of? Yeah. So because he wasn't convicted of any of those, or he's even not charged, technically. he wasn't even charged. Right. Is he on? He's not on a serial killer list. I mean, he really shouldn't be then, if that's the case. Right. I I mean, I don't know what the 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 actual um, definition. If, if they closed the eleven cold cases and right. attributed to him, I, that might count. Then he would be on a list. Yeah. I imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thanks. Gosh. Serial killer and hexer. Yes. Yeah. I, Boy, I, that hex thing scares me. You it all does die. Me, right? Before it scares I, me too, man. I believe in that crap. That's nasty. I know yeah. you do. Yeah, that's no joke. If if I had been in that courtroom, I don't. I would have cried. I think. Oh, I would have ran home yeah. and saged myself. Right. <laughs> yep. I, don't want I don't even know what that does. With- <laughs> also, I feel like um, the trials and stuff, the speed of it. I don't. Was that just the way things were back then? Because this, mm-hmm. when you were talking, reminded me of remember Helen Clevenger, mm-hmm. the how quickly that went. It was like literally within weeks it was Yeah, because they don't have any results that they need to wait to get back. They didn't have DNA. They didn't have blood. It was just like whatever they found is what they found. This is all the information. Nothing new is coming out. Let's just move on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in his case, um, regardless of how they got the confession, he did sign a confession. Mm -hmm. At that point, what are we waiting for? Let's take it to trial. My my shock was at how fast the sentencing was after the trial. Right. And then yeah. Mm-hmm. How yeah. fast his execution, his first execution date was supposed to be. Yeah. That yeah, mm-hmm. yeah they're moving and shaking over here. They, mm-hmm. There's no there was no waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Mm. And hanging. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it was really a shame too because I read an account. I didn't put that in there. I read an account that a clergy member was reading like his last words because he did not speak the day of his execution. He mm. made one little comment. Um, I read to a guard as he was b- being taken to the gallows, but he didn't speak himself. As the clergyman was reading his last statements, they went ahead and pulled that lever and hung him before they could finish the statements. Stop. Yeah. Now see. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's just horrible. Even even in your death, you're not given dignity. You know? Yeah, it's, it was it was a shame. So very interesting side note there. Yeah, that's like right until the last minute, let's not treat him like mm-hmm. he deserves anything. Mm-hmm. Any regard. So I went respect. to this crime museum. Right. Okay. (laughs) But it had like all these, because back then there was no jail, there was no prison. We didn't have that kind of stuff. So people were just punished. Mm -hmm. However, they saw Mm -hmm. fit or they were killed or executed or whatever. And the way that they would execute people was like, guys. And then, and you know, we're like, oh, the justice system is so behind and it's so no, no, Mm -hmm. we have come far. Yeah. Okay, because the things yes. that they used to do to people to execute them were horrendous. Yeah. yeah. Even those gallows, the way that they mm-hmm. would do it was like mm-hmm. not meant to kill them. It like humane. No, they were meant to, to skilled, torture them. Yeah. You had to have somebody who was skilled enough to make the noose the right size so that you're ne- – this is not good speaking or like good topic to speak on, but – you had to have it done the right way so that you didn't suffer. Right. Because if your neck didn't snap, you stayed there until you were choked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was and crazy. even at that, they might have to rehang you. Yes. Oh yes. Gosh. And that's Whoa. what I was reading is it would have. Yes. Mm-mm. It's crazy. Mm-mm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Don't sign me up for that. No. Yeah. Mm-mm. Nope. It's very Maybe interesting too. and awful yeah. and horrific and. Not fair. No. Yeah. No. No. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Gold gosh. Oh, my gosh. I don't even think I can follow that one. Oh, you can. <laughs> I know you can. I know you got it. Christy I don't know. Closer. <laughs> Christy the closer. That's Mom's right. not ready. <laughs> Throw a few pitches out first. Oh, oh. Well, the only thing I got for me is that this case is straight out of Compton, guys. Oh, hey. Oh. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And it is also not on Halloween. It's just the season of Halloween. And has- we'll allow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it has definitely connections to Halloween. It's just not a Halloween murder. So. Well, don't hex us. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Please keep that up. Although I think I'm okay. I'm set up. I got Sage. Do you need Sage? I got you. No, I have I've, some. I don't okay. even know what that means. Protection. Okay. Where do Tens I get it? This is your energy. What do I do? <laughs> I'll send you. Burn it. I'm a, I'll mail you some. Can I go to? Can I go to um like Whole Foods and get that or something? Probably, actually. Okay. I, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I try to ethically get my sage though now. Me too. Because it is, and it's like indigenous people that is part of their um matters like, practices, and so I I do try to yeah because I you 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 can go on Amazon and get sage. I was just bundles. getting ready to say don't buy it from Amazon. Yeah, no, I do try to like ethically source it from people who that is part of their practices now. And yeah, so we well, also need to go get a room somewhere and talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. The, I have no quarterly, know quarterly meeting. About it. I got oh, a that sage. Part of the quarterly meeting. Okay. I have to sage my closet because we talk a lot about murder in here, and it's creepy. You really oh, yeah. do that? Yes, I really do that. I Maybe. we got a big um, obsidian. Um, what what are what is that called? Crystal. Obelisk. Obelisk. Yeah. Um, obsidian because it it like the crystal it is a protection. Yeah, it's yeah, a stone. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's um it is like a protection and also wards off like unwanted or negativity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we we have we have some things that happen huh. in this house. I have to regularly. I got the house on lockdown spiritually, metaphysically. It's on lockdown because mm-hmm. we oh, talk about yeah. way too much crazy stuff. True. Okay. Well, yeah. maybe I need to. Yes. Okay. Qu- okay. <laughs> First quarterly meeting. Let's let's educate Christy on this because I <laughs> legitimately have no clue what you. And y'all about. people listening need to be saging your cars or whatever right. you're listening whatever to. This stuff. Right. <laughs> Sage, Sage your, your ears. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. You're really not crazy. I swear. I'm a normal. No, I don't think you're crazy. I mean, I'm no better. better for a so whatever. <laughs> I don't think she's crazy. I'm I just, just like. Saying, Right. I just, for me, it's like cover all bases. Right. Okay. You know, right. some people pray. That's fine. Some people, you know, run around screaming. <laughs> that's fine too. If that's what gets you by. Some people so meditate. We do all some of people the sage. Above. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> cover your bases. Okay. I'll do okay. all of the above because I definitely pray. <laughs> I definitely scream. Maybe I should sage. <laughs> it doesn't hurt I to me. I mean, what what's the worst it can do? It make your house smelly for a little bit. Right. It's right. Fine. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I'll look into it. You guys, well, you guys will teach me about it. All right. Okay. But well, I'm going to bring you back to Compton. All right. Yes. Compton. Yes. Uh, this is the murder of Jose Lara or Lara and Gloria Villalta. Do you guys, have you heard of them? Um, no. No. I haven't. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's start with, for those of you who do not know, which I don't know who wouldn't know this, but Compton is a city in Southern California and it's just South of LA. Yeah, if, sure if you that. don't know, we can't. You if you don't know, then you don't know, and right. we don't. Yeah. We don't mess with you. Yeah, just go I, somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, stay here and educate yourself. Stay here, stay here, stay here. Yes. Okay. So Jose Lara was fifty-one, and he had emigrated to the U.S. from Mexico. He was a very hard worker who held down two jobs to help support his family. He worked in construction, and had just like a couple of side jobs that he would um, do as well. One of which was with a rental company and they would rent out like, I mean, I don't know if this was the case, but like bounce houses or Mm -hmm. tables and chairs, stuff for like parties in general. And so his job would be to do this on weekends. And so he would call on like Wednesday or Thursday, get his route, go pick up the stuff on Friday, drop it off Sunday, go back and pick all this Mm -hmm. stuff up. And so his common law wife, Gloria, although I will mention that officially California does not recognize common law marriages, but not anymore. This is how she was referred to this entire time. Um, 
Gloria would go with him on these routes on the weekends. What year was this? This is in 2011. Yeah, I don't I don't think they were acknowledging that at no, that they point. Weren't. Yeah, they they did away with that after a while, but um they did like grandfather in some circumstances. So that's I'm I'm sure that's still accurate. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just how they referred to him whether it was yeah. like legal or not. Um so she's 58, 7 years his senior. Um mm-hmm. she went with him to keep him company. The two were an older couple who had found each other at an older age. I don't know how they found each other. Don't ask me. But they got together, <laughs> making it work. Bumble. On. Love is love, people. Move love on. is love. No, no idea where where they met. But gotcha. um, they lived in a lower income community with Gloria's two children. She had two daughters, Diana, who was twenty four, and Cynthia, who was fourteen. And both girls had two different dads. Um, I could only find info in Cynthia's f- father and. It's not really even all that much. All I know is that he was deported to Honduras when she was very little. So Mm -hmm. he didn't really, wasn't really a part of her life at all. Yeah. Okay. So she basically, single mom raising two girls, finds Jose and they were making things happen. And it wasn't too long after this that Diana moves out because, you know, she's 24, she's older. She's starting to just kind of start her life and get her life together. So we leave Jose, Gloria, and Cynthia in the home. And as you asked earlier, this is in 2011. So Jose and Gloria do everything they can at this time to provide a great life for Cynthia. As I said, he's working multiple jobs um, mm-hmm. to provide whatever she needs and wants. And this isn't even her biological dad. She He completely takes her under the, his wing as if this is his uh-huh. daughter. Okay. Yeah. Um, and some of the friends that I've, I saw, so this was also on a snapped. <laughs> so, um, they say that they were kind of making up, making it up to her that she lived in this poor neighborhood. So they would just mm-hmm. kind of provide her whatever she wanted so that she, you know, just didn't feel bad about where she lived, I guess. I don't know. Um, I should also mention here that Gloria wasn't in the greatest health. She had diabetes and was partially blind and used a walker. So, mm. She's clearly not working and probably needs help herself. Right. And so Jose's basically doing it all, essentially. Wow. And she has medical bills. So whatever's not going to Cynthia and what they want to provide to her is going to Gloria's medical bills. She's constantly being taken shopping and she has loves to dress well, loves to do her makeup. She has... And this was mentioned so many times that I just had to mention she has an iPod touch. Oh. <laughs> so I don't know why this was like made sure we pointed that was out a big deal. So yeah. many times that she had an iPod touch. Yeah. Um, along with all of that, Cynthia's, and I'm totally gonna say this wrong. Quincinera? Quincinera. Quincinera. Okay, there we go. Um, that was approaching. Which is, if anybody doesn't know, which I'll, clearly you guys understand what it is, but basically you're transitioning from girlhood to womanhood at the age of 15. I actually went to one party when I was when I was younger. And it was kind of like the – very different because I feel like it was celebrated a little bit more like there was a mass mm-hmm. and then a party. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, whereas like we did sweet 16s. I don't know if anybody else – I was just going to point that out. It's like a sweet 16 party but yes. more – but there's like a religious element to it's, it. It's yes. like a sweet 16 if the girl was getting married because you have like your formal court. There's dances. There's procession. It's very um, formal and official. And it's, mm-hmm. yeah, it's basically as expensive and extravagant can be as a wedding. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Is it, yeah. yeah. I'm Filipino. We do that too in the Philippines. Right. So. It's a little bit older though, right? It's not called a quinceanera. No, it's a quinceanera. Is it? Yeah. I thought it was like a little older age. We thank the Spanish for that. Right. <laughs> I just thought it was. No. It's a okay. Quinceanera. Never mind. I, never mind. I don't know. Nope. It's all good. According to my research, it was it's um, celebrated in Mexico, Latin America, the Caribbean, and in Latin communities in like the U.S. Yeah, essentially. Um. Anyways, hers was approaching in September of 2011, so they wanted to be able to again provide the big celebration for her and all that. So I'm just I mentioned all of that just to show you how much they wanted to provide for her and all the things, no matter how hard things were for them, no matter what else they had going on, 
Cynthia was always put first and given everything. I'm getting bad bad vibes about Cynthia. I know. Yeah, I was, I was a little say, bit. I like, <laughs> think I'm pushing this a little much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then he's got the hookup with the party rentals for the party. Well, very yeah. true. true. I'm sure he was getting the hookup, actually. I, I bet he was, yeah. yeah. I mean, use what you have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm sure he was very resourceful. Yeah. So I'm also, and as you guys just mentioned, not sure that she is appreciating them mm-hmm. or anything that they are doing for them. So she, cause she would often, often get mad at them for being strict. They would keep tabs mm-hmm. on her. She had a strict curfew and all of these things were in place because she had starting, started dating this man mm-hmm. or not man, boy that Gloria and Jose were not too fond of. So they were mm-hmm. just like, well. We're just and also, keep you on she's a short. fourteen. Yeah, right. Exactly. She's about to turn fifteen. And fine, you're going into womanhood, but really, are you yeah. at fifteen? No. I mean, I guess the no. symbolism and all that kind of stuff. But like, yeah. I, I mean, my kid's a fifteen year old, and he's not an adult. Yeah, your baby, your yeah. baby. Yeah. So Gloria, I mean Cynthia, and Giovanni Gallardo, that is his name, met in Dominguez High School in Compton where they were all in several special ed classes together. There's not a Mm -hmm. whole lot of detail on why they were in those classes together. Some say that Cynthia had some sort of language processing disorder. I mean, clearly if maybe Uh, this wasn't her first language, then maybe a lot of that was ESL because we had a lot of that in my school. Like they would just put the ESL kids in special education. Yeah. Which is not what they needed. No, no, no. No, they, like, they need a curriculum that could that could yeah. reach them at what language they needed. Yeah, yeah, yes, we, exactly. yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. So I don't really know. There wasn't anything about what Giovanni why he was in there, but they, I just mm-hmm. it was mentioned that they met in these special ed classes. Okay. So, and I don't really know why Gloria and Jose also did not approve of their relationship, but they didn't, and they didn't hide the fact that they didn't like him. Mm-hmm. They would okay. often tell her that. We don't want you to see him anymore. And so then when they were told that, the two would then run away. They would right. scrounge up whatever money they could get, buy a ticket on a bus as far as they could with the money, get there, and then always end up back home. Because it was like, well, what were they going to do once they got there? Right. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was, yeah, not, not the best. So September's approaching for her big party celebration. I'm not even, I can't, I'm not even going to try and keep saying the word. <laughs> <laughs> but her big party was coming. And so they're like, you know what? We're going to give up on this right now. Let's just, we don't want the added stress. Let's just make peace with them and get through this party. Mm-hmm. So the celebration comes and goes. And I suppose was a, was a success. And Jose is still working super hard to provide for his girls. However, on Friday, October 14th, 2011, his employer from the rental company was worried because he hadn't heard, she hadn't heard from him, you know, t- he used to call to get the route mm. and her, and then, which was very unlikely, unlike him. And then she didn't hear from him all weekend. So not only didn't he call for the routes, but then he never mm. showed up to do. Oh, wow. oh, no. So she went over, she's like, all right, I'm going to go check on him. Cause this isn't like him. So she goes over on Monday, October 17th. When she arrived, no one was home. She looked inside and can see that it was somewhat of a mess in there, which Also, she didn't think was very usual. So she kind of talked around around the community. I think they lived in a mobile home. I'm not 100%, but I I think. Um, So they talked to a few of the neighbors um, that were out, and they had said, well, we heard that Gloria was in the hospital because she had had eye surgery and that Jose has been with her. We haven't seen them around, but we saw Cynthia, and that's what Cynthia told us. But one of the neighbors that Cynthia spoke to about this also said that he had seen where he spoke to her was where Cynthia was throwing trash out at the dumpsters. And that's where they had a conversation. And what they noticed was that she, she had said, well, my mom had surgery. I'm going to clean the house out before she comes back. So they're like, Oh, she's being a good daughter. Except what they noticed was that she was throwing away pictures, like family pictures and some of Gloria's clothes and some tools and just like, really weird things that you're cleaning the house before your mom comes home. You're going to throw away family pictures. Right. And clothes that she might need to wear. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. She's coming home from the hospital. Right. So she probably needs those. Yeah. So he thought that was a little bit weird. And then another neighbor said they had they had seen Jose's truck behind the Home Depot nearby. And so the employer drives to that Home Depot, sees the truck behind it with open windows, and it's kind of like, all right, this is weird. I'm calling I'm calling Diana, the other daughter. Mm. And she's like, uh, I didn't know my mom was in the hospital. <laughs> oh, what are you talking about? News to me, yeah, yeah, pretty sure it, I, they would have told me, but nope, nope. So Diana comes over, and they call the police to come because they're like, "Well, something's really wrong now." So let's. Mm-hmm. So on October 18th, the police arrive at the home to do a routine wellness check, and what they find is just a little bit disturbing. They walk in, and the house looks completely ransacked: clothes, trash all over, food rotting in the kitchen. And the home looks like it's just been broken into and burglarized. There's no valuables in the house. Like any jewelry box was completely empty. Anything that was of value was gone. Mm. There's no blood at the scene. So they're just thinking, okay, well, I guess, you know, somebody broke in, but where is Jose and Gloria? We don't know. Yeah, that doesn't answer that question. Right. So they question the neighbors just and – just as the employer had done, and they hear pretty much the same stuff from them. Um, They hadn't seen Gloria or Jose come and go for a few days. Cynthia said they were in – she had surgery, but the neighbor who had seen her throw the trash out, you know, tells them of that. And they're like, hmm, okay, well, that's strange. Police look through the house and look and out on a mattress. There's a mattress in the living room. I don't know why, but there is. And they find a notebook on this mattress. And in large writing, they see phrases written throughout this notebook, quoting, I'm quoting here, I am scared. I cannot do it. Do you think you can kill her in bed? What about if she's going to bed? Can you kill her? She is sitting down. You do it. So these are all like on different pieces, like pages, you know, separate. So So like text messages. Yeah. Essentially. Big enough for somebody to see across a room. So like across a room or or like out of the window or something. Yeah. Because Mm -hmm. remember Gloria is like, she's partially blind. So, you know, and she's walking around the house apparently at this point. And so there's notes being written back and forth and just being shown. Ew. So they call all the hospitals in the area at this point and they find out that Gloria has not been at any hospital nearby. Mm. And then they go to school to try and find Cynthia. And then they find out that she has not been attending classes in quite a few days. So now they're concerned. Now they're thinking also, well, okay, well, where's Cynthia? Is she missing because she did something or is she missing because she's now part of Jose and Gloria's? Right. So they find out where Giovanni lives because they find out that he has, she had a boyfriend they go to the his house and they speak with his mom. She's like, "Well, I haven't seen him in a couple of days. I saw him last night, but or yesterday, but I haven't seen him." So they're like, "Well, can you can you go ahead and try and contact him, see if he'll come home, tell him we need to talk to him or do whatever you can, say whatever you need to say to get mm-hmm. him to come back." So she does that. And the next day she calls and she's like, "Okay, they came home. I've got them in the car. I'm bringing them to you to talk to you." So on October 19th, she brings him to the police station so that they can talk. Police separate the two in different rooms. And when police say that they're looking for her mother, Cynthia initially let them know, well, Jose told me on Wednesday, the 12th, well, your mom's in the hospital. She's having surgery. She doesn't want any visitors. So just take care of things at home for a little bit. And then a few days later over the weekend, she says, Jose came back after staying with her mom and pulled a gun on her and Giovanni and forced them to throw out all of her mother's possessions and pictures. Okay. And so, yeah. I believe that. That escalated right. quickly. Right. right. Yeah. Jose, the guy who does everything for you, buys you an iPod touch, throws a giant celebration for right. you. And he's going to pull a gun and be like, now throw all of my wife's belongings. Right. Away. Please do that. Yes. Makes sense. It, does. it makes a whole lot of sense. And so at this point, Cynthia is like, well, but I'm really worried about my mom. Once that happened, I got worried about my mom and where is she? I'm scared of Jose. So I don't call the police because I don't know what she's gonna, he's going to do to her or what he's already done. What's he going to do to me? Blah, blah, blah. 
So not long after the interview starts, they take out that notebook that they found. Mm. And they're like, okay, so what about this? And she admits, that's my notebook. And it's also my handwriting. And then they, she starts to give detectives a different story. Her and Giovanni had talked about killing her mother and stepfather for a couple of weeks. She said Giovanni had mentioned it several times after she had told him that Jose had raped her. Which, by the way, I would like to say is allegedly because nothing has ever been proven and nobody will ever say that that could even possibly be true. So, But she told Giovanni that he had raped her and also that her mom was abusive to her. Mm. Her mom in a walker, partially blind with diabetes, is abusing her. Huge threat. I mean, I, there's levels of abuse and maybe maybe it's not physical. Maybe it's emotional or, you know, verbal abuse. I, I would never okay. downplay that. But, I mean, come on. They give you everything. Everything. Literally. I don't everything. buy it. Yeah. Yeah, that's manipulation. That sounds like uh, Michelle Notek oh. claiming, claiming rape. Her father raped her. When she was mm-hmm. a teenager. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's the start of manipulation right there. Yeah, because nobody nobody even comes close to corroborating that this would be even the case. Family members, friends, nothing has ever seen nobody's ever seen anything that would even suggest yeah. any of that. So mm. so she said that once Giovanni mentioned the idea of killing them, she liked the idea, but at the same time didn't because she's like, Well, it's my mom and my stepdad. You know, we shouldn't kill them. Right. Where's the where's oh my, my stuff God. gonna come? What happens when the iPod gets, you know, updated? Where am I gonna get the new iPod from? Right, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Oh Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Like, oh, man. Let's kill your mom and dad. Well, <laughs> well who okay. kind of has no about that, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. So on Wednesday the twelfth, Giovanni comes to her house around four thirty in the afternoon with a backpack. That includes rubbing alcohol, a towel, an aluminum baseball bat, and a Halloween mask. Oh. So okay. basically his murder kit. All <laughs> right. What was the mask? Yeah, I was going to say, what was the mask? Yeah, what was Hold on. Oh, oh, she didn't do it. Just, just hold on. <laughs> all right. Well, whatever. I'll tell you. It's like it was a skeleton type mask, but it was all black. Okay. So oh. it had like a skeleton face, but it was not white. It was black. The whole the whole thing. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Mm-mm. So she said that he told her that they should kill them today. And she was like, no, we shouldn't do that today. Mm -hmm. Gloria was in the house, just cooking dinner, apparently making some soup for them, Mm. preparing, you know, just for a lovely evening. And around 730, Cynthia said she went outside while Giovanni killed her mother with the rubbing alcohol. (laughs) With the rubbing alcohol? That's the So Yeah. So apparently they felt like it was... The same thing as what is that stuff? Chloroform. That you put? Oh, Chloroform. My like that's word. children. That's what they thought was what people did. So he had the towel and the rubbing alcohol to put over her mouth. Which apparently, when he did this to her, she did collapse. <laughs> I mean, well, he probably you know. smothered her. Yeah. Right. Yes. Exactly. So he does this and strangles her to death. But oh, Cynthia is saying she's outside when this is all happening. She leaves. Mm-hmm. Then he he does this calls her back in and so she sees her mom dead on the floor and is and they so then they proceeded to tie her up with duct tape and bound her arms and legs together and put her in the bedroom. So she's okay. like Okay. Well I guess she did it. So now we're in it. So here we go. Let's move on. Yeah. So then they go and watch TV for a well, little bit. As you do. You gotta That's, decompress. Right. I mean you're fifteen. You get ready for yeah. the next right. Exactly. Oh my God. By the way, he's 16. He's only a year older. I don't think I said that, but he's 16. Mm, okay. Jose was due to arrive home between 8 and 8 30. And Giovanni, when he came home, was hiding behind the door. Apparently, Jose came in and then left, like walked out to go say, talk to a neighbor, and then came back in. So it was like he had warning that Jose was home. And so when he went out to talk to the neighbor, he then hid behind the door. So when Jose walked back in, he hit him over the head twice twice with a baseball bat. Oh. So Jose went unconscious and at some point mm-hmm. Jose regained consciousness and that's when Giovanni said, asked Cynthia to get him a knife and he then he repeatedly stabbed him oh until Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And they but they didn't find blood? 
No. Shockingly, did not find blood. What? No idea. Because this place was in disarray. So I have no idea how they didn't find blood and how these two cleaned it up. Because none of that's actually reported on. It's yeah, and they don't seem like the the ones that know how to clean up. No. Not if they're using rubbing alcohol to try to smother somebody. Mm-mm. No. No. Interesting. And- and the, with the following details I'm about to tell you, they don't know. They're they're hot mess altogether. So oh, I don't okay. know how this is possible. Mm-hmm. So they take his body to where Gloria's is and wrap wrap him in a blanket. And then later that night, like, you know, one in the morning-ish, they drag both the bodies out and put them in Gloria's Jeep. They drive around just to find somewhere to put the bodies. And they end up in North Long Beach, which was not too far away from where they lived and found a vacant lot and dug a shallow grave. They put Jose inside. And as they put him inside, they realized, well, this isn't big enough to fit Gloria. So I guess we'll just have to move on because we're not going to take him out and dig more. Just cover him up. We'll put Gloria back in or leave her in the car and we'll, we'll figure out another place for her. Except they didn't find one right away. So this is where the story gets really messed up as if killing your mom and stepdad isn't already messed up. It's about to get even more messed up. Oh, God. So they go home, take showers, clean up, go to bed, and then go to school the next day. All with Gloria still in the back of the car. Oh. They begin to sell off all of the jewelry and anything of value in the house. And I think it's stated that they made like $480 or something like that out of everything. Wow. Oh, my God. And with that $480, they proceed to plan a Halloween party. Cynthia really wants to have a Halloween party. <sighs> So they well, go you out know, she was due to have that big party, and now that's, that's not right. going to happen. No, so. she already she had already that had. big party in September. Oh, she did have she, that. Yeah, okay. she already had that. Now she got a party for Halloween. Yeah. Now she's like, I got to invite all my friends over. That's probably why she cleaned up all the blood, because she needed a party for Halloween. Oh. Right. Okay. So they go out to Party City and buy decorations, and they go get some chips and soda and candy with all that money and start to decorate the house, all while Gloria's in the back of the Jeep. Oh, wow. Still. I'm sure it's oh, got to start smelling at some point. No? I mean, yes. Yes. Yeah. Days in, huh? Yes. So finally on the third day, they're like, all right, we got to do something with, with mom here. So they drive to Norwalk, which is a neighboring town, and find an abandoned house, dig another grave, and put her inside it, cover her up, and leave. So this is what they're hearing. During her interview, detectives are asking her why, over the course of a couple of weeks, that, that they had discussed why, she, you know, a- apparently her and Giovanni are discussing this over a couple of weeks. So why, over that those few weeks, did you not put a stop to it? Like, why weren't you like, stop? Yeah. Because she's blaming Giovanni for all this. Like, well, right. Giovanni decided we're going to do this. Giovanni killed my mom and then he killed my stepdad. And I just kind of helped him get a, like, right. clean up. And so, or why didn't you just leave him if you didn't really want this to happen? And she's like, well, he's going to find me no matter what. This is all, you can watch this um, interrogation online. Like, I mean, it's all on there. And I'm just afraid of him. He would have found me. If I had left, he would have found me. And he probably would, I don't know what he would have done to me. Mm -hmm. So now let's go to Giovanni's interview. He starts stating a lot of the same things, but saying, I committed the murders. Cynthia had nothing to do with it. And he starts talking about how Jose threatened them with a gun and, you know, again, some of the same things that Cynthia had said. But then the police let them know, let him know, well, you know, Cynthia told us all that too, but then she told us the real story. Mm -hmm. And so Giovanni was like, well, crap, what does that mean? She told you the Mm -hmm. real story. Okay. Well, I guess I'll tell you the real story. So... He starts talking and he's like, we've been talking about it for a couple weeks. I came to the house with my backpack full of tools. And at some point, Gloria went to the bathroom and Cynthia said, go, go quick. So Mm -hmm. she said it. And basically, go ahead and do it. The story was the same except for the part about Cynthia saying, okay, go do it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, everything happened the same, but it's really, he's like, no, but she kept telling me, go, go, go. You do, Mm -hmm. you do, you do. And also it stated that while Jose was unconscious, Cynthia apparently hit him seven times in the legs with a bat. Oh. So she had more of a part than she was admitting to in that. Why he also so angry? God. 
I don't know because he did everything for her. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I don't Maybe know. Maybe they didn't have the iPlan iTunes plan that she wanted. She wasn't getting good music on her iPad mm. or iPod. The Wi-Fi was spotty. <laughs> the Wi-Fi was spotty. Yeah. Very sus. Makes you angry. Yeah. You angry. you really got to be angry to to whack somebody like right. that. When they're just laying there unconscious. Right. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah, a little weird. Hmm. He also Giovanni also states um that Cynthia was mad at her mom that day because she had taken away her iPod touch. Oh my gosh. And there we go with the iPad. iPod. And, iPod. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's why the house was ransacked because after they did this, they were tearing the house apart looking for it. And oh eventually he finds it. And he's like, in the interview, now his interview I did not see. I only watched Cynthia's. Mm. But apparently in the interview, it was like he was proud that he could provide that for her. Like, I found I found the iPod touch for you. Like, here you go. Because out of that everything, way. that's all that matters here. That's right. Yes, apparently. Yeah. I love yes. that it's like iPod touch. Is it? This is not just an iPod. Mm. No, it's iPod touch. It's an yeah. iPod touch. This is right. a big deal. It's a big deal. So he also states at some point in the following days that he threw the knife and the baseball bat away into like a yard and a random trash can. And he was just getting away getting rid of all of the, the, mm -hmm. the evidence. Police put them in the same room after they had questioned them separately, but they left a camera rolling mm. in the background. And then they saw a side of Cynthia that they had not seen. She took charge and she was basically telling him how to handle the interviews and everything going forward. And so it was clear that she wasn't this innocent victim mm -hmm. that she was portraying from the beginning. Yeah. So after the interviews, Giovanni rode around with the police, showed them where, you know, the baseball bat was, the knife was, showed him where um, Jose's body was, and actually went to show him where Gloria's was. But Gloria's was not there because, interesting, Gloria's body was actually found on the 15th. So these interviews are happening on the 19th. Her body was found on the 15th by mm -hmm. a jogger in that neighborhood. Oh. But her face was so unrecognizable that they listed her as a Joan, Jane Doe. At the time. Oh. oh. Yeah. So needless to say, long story short, guys, they're both arrested. They're both tried as adults mm -hmm. in separate trials. Cynthia started in April of 2013. So like two years later, almost two years later. Um, she was 16 going on 17, but because she was 15, she got she was being charged for a lesser mm -hmm. crime. But anyway, she maintained her story of being abused by her mother and sexually abused by Jose. Multiple family members testified that that could not be the case. There's no chance that that happened. The prosecutor at one point in an interview in, in an interview on Snapped said that when she asked about the notebook during the trial, and if she had written those things, and if she wanted Giovanni to kill them, Cynthia said yes to all of that. And in her head, she was like, well, you just admitted to first degree murder, honey, when you right. admitted that oh, right wow. before you wanted him to do it. You wrote all those notes to him, and then you told him to do it. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. During both trials, psychologists said that Cynthia suffered from a form of PTSD because of the alleged abuse and that she was living in a fantasy world that life would be better with her, without her parents. Giovanni's psychologist said he was very much a follower in every way, so proving the point that she led him down this path. And mm. he was actually borderline mentally retarded, according to their um so he Report. he really was in like a special needs class. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I believe she took full advantage of the fact that he would just do whatever she More wanted him to do. Likely. Yeah. Wow. I, I mean, unless so, she really had some issues too, it's... I, she well, obviously no. did. I, yeah, there <laughs> were some issues there. <laughs> right. Yes. But she needed somebody to like carry out these events like... Right. Okay. Oh, she totally man manipulated him and... Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. So on May 10th of 2013, she was sentenced to 51 years to life. And a month later, Giovanni was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. He wow. received a harsher sentence, as I said earlier, because at the time, there were harsher penalties for people who committed crimes when you were older than 15. 
and he was 16 at the time. She was mm. only 15. Yeah. She is serving her sentence in Central California's women's facility in Couchilla. 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 Couch- Ooh, see, mistyped. I typed it wrong. And he is in a substance abuse treatment center and state prison in Corcoran. Yeah, Corcoran. Mm-hmm. Corcoran. California. Wow. And there you have it. Cynthia Alvarez. Is she eligible for parole at some point? He's yes. not. Yes. That's she a scary could be. thought. Yeah. He is not. Yeah. That's a scary thought because going into the system at 15. And even a master if you were, manipulator. Right. And That's you, what I was just going to say. She was obviously 17. the psychotic one. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he was just not able to determine whether I feel like he wasn't able to determine that he was really yeah. even doing anything wrong. And he was just following his what Cynthia said. It's like, yeah. oh, I love yeah, her. Yeah, that's do what she wants. unfortunate because there it, it, people who have, you know, any any type of like mental um like disability, it you don't know what at what level do they understand what they're doing. Mm-hmm. It's it's hard to know, but you yeah. at the same time he committed, you know, murders. <laughs> you can't right. not punish somebody. Yeah, and, and, and cover them up, up. and cut co- and help cover them up, and you know yeah. was willing to lie and yeah, yeah. Wow. <sighs> so there you have it, guys. This it's, is why you say no to your children sometimes. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, you iPod them that you work, iPod touch. <laughs> no iPod touches. None. Which is funny because our Mara had one. But here's the thing about our oldest. Here's the thing. We have always said you get good grades, you get a reward. You get, you know, that's that's just the way it is. That's how we parented. You know, if you are doing your best at school and we know that you're doing your best and you are getting, you know, the the proof of that is your grades. Mm-hmm. You can have anything that you want come report card time. Yeah. For her, it was like, I want to color my hair red. I don't care. She was 11 years old. We dyed her hair red. I sure mm-hmm. did. Um, she earned an iPad, iPod touch. She saved her birthday money and her Christmas money over the course of like a year and a half to go out and buy that herself. Oh, well, that's different. Yeah. And so when you were saying iPod touch, I was like, yeah, we know all about this. Stupid <laughs> things. Yes. We know all about them because it was like a big deal. Yeah. In the yeah. music library that she had, it was not cheap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 99 cents a song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they they were a big deal. But, I mean, say no every once in a while or say earn it or, I don't know, you can't just give your kids whatever they want. They don't learn. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And Did they ever say what the significance was about the skeleton mask? No. It was just that. Was just, in his just, kit, yeah. just in the event that he would like. Yeah, because clearly he didn't use it. Right. I don't think he right. used it because he was just in the house hanging out and then he attacked her. So, so maybe that would have been it. like if they decided it would be like a middle of the night thing and we're going to pretend it was a break in and hmm. you can right. wear this mask or whatever. Like, I don't know. We're going to cover really, all our bases. Can you yeah. really know that on the iPod touch? <laughs> 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 Does anybody really know what was going on in Giovanni's head though when he put rubbing alcohol and a mask in? You know, so right, yeah. yeah. I mean, who knows? Who know? Maybe it was already in there because he was like, "Oh, it's Halloween." I mean, it's almost Halloween. Yeah, it's it almost happened Halloween. to be his what Halloween bag. Right. I, I want to show. I want to show Cynthia my mask that I'm going to wear for the party. So we're gonna, oh yeah. my! This is the big because party. they were little. They were 15 and yeah. and dumb it's that crap. Season, it's that season two, but I, I do believe it's a dia. Dia de los Muertos mask. Mm-hmm. That, oh, that could have been. Oh, could have been. Got yeah, it. You're right. Do you have a picture of that? Uh, the mask? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it was. Because, I mean. Are they black, though? Uh, they're different they, colors. They can yeah. be. Oh, okay. They can be. Usually they're, they're usually like decorative. Because yeah. It's yeah. Right. yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like they're colorful. I feel yeah. like I've yeah. seen them. Yeah, my yeah. daughter has a couple. She thinks they're amazing. They are. They're beautiful. They are. They're beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. Like artwork. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I. That's. Who knows? Who yeah. knows? 
they may have seen it in the store and thought, oh, this would be cool to kill somebody while I'm wearing a death mask. I don't. Yeah. Oh my. Who yeah. Knows? Who knows? Mm. Yeah. Man, these kids. Those are some messed up Halloween stories, ladies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween's supposed to be fun. This is this is the season <laughs> of fall and everything good and birthdays and I love Halloween yeah. actually. I, I think it's really fun to be spooked out, but not by murder. <laughs> right. Hey, we chose to do this episode. Right. True. <laughs> we chose we violence. <laughs> like we made a plan for this. <laughs> we did. We oh did. no, I'm here for it. I'm just saying <laughs> I like Halloween for different reasons. Yeah. Y'all should send us pictures of your Halloween costumes. Everybody, everyone out there, send us oh, yeah. Halloween costume pictures. That would Christy be fun. Won't. She doesn't dress up. I don't dress Ooh. up either. You. Oh. You, Christy. <laughs> she I won't. used to. I used to, but I don't. My mom does for like yeah. anything. She does. She <laughs> dresses up all year. She was Hello Kitty not long ago. Nice. Oh, I love it. Like on a random <laughs> Tuesday. Yeah. No, hey. it's a Friday. It was Friday. Still, do, we, do we need a reason? <laughs> yeah. Do we need a reason she to does be not. Hello Kitty? She does not. I, I am. I 100 percent can get behind that. She sent me her latest costume the other day. So oh, don't tell me because I might. I'm not. I'm like, <laughs> her her she mom has these like neighborhood parties, and she always dresses up. And okay, well, the your neighbor mom sounds like a who? She's so fun. Oh my gosh. I'll <laughs> yeah. send you pictures of her house too when she decorates it. She loves yeah. Halloween. She decorates her house like crazy. Oh yeah. Well, mm -hmm. we've got some things planned for our house and Bryce does <laughs> anyways. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna be on fire this year. That's right. Yeah. Not literally. Oh, <laughs> no, not not literally. <laughs> But no, it's gonna look like the house is on fire. Cool. And yeah, there's there's some stuff. Fun. Well, yeah. I hope everybody had a good Halloween. We are so excited that Jess and Bryce joined us for our episode. Thank yes. you for having us. Yeah, thank you. We had Any fun time, as always. If you guys, do you want to plug your podcast? Where can people find you? Oh God! Uh, I everything everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> um, we're mainly on Instagram, so it's what happens in the woods. W h i t h podcast. Did I say that right? No, no I w didn't say that. W what happens in the woods? W h i t w. Sorry, it's been a long day, people. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> I don't even know. Maybe you should have done that. You never do it. Go ahead. You can message us and we'll send you where to find them. How about that? <laughs> Just look for what happens in the wood podcast. Yeah. Yeah. We we have a website and we have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're really only on Instagram, though. I'm not going to lie. Same. I'm not going to lie. It's yeah. hard to keep up on everything else. But our Instagram automatically goes to our Facebook. So all yes. we have to do is yes, <laughs> respond to something if it gets but right. mostly people are on Instagram too, anyways. I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you can find us there. Um, you can find any of our episodes on on our website. Apple, Google. Apple, Apple, Google, Spotify. any of it. Yeah. All the places. Yep. Same place if you're listening to Climbs, Crimes and Closets, you're you're gonna be able to find us. Yeah. We're on the same things. Yeah. And if you need help, just send us a message and we'll send you <laughs> their way. And <laughs> Yeah. So thanks for joining us. We love you guys. We are so excited that we were able to partner up and go check them out. Maybe there's a surprise on their podcast too, and you may hear a familiar voice. You never know. You never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Join us next week, guys, for another regular episode with Crimes and Closets. And always remember, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet.